Amen. Amen. So if you haven't turned there yet, uh, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there should be Bibles in the uh, chairs in front of you. But Philippians chapter 4, um, the, the, the church of Philippi, as you're turning there, uh, was a church that the Apostle Paul had great affection for. He loved this church because though it may have been a smaller church like ours, they were great in giving. They were an extremely generous church. And so the book of Philippians in, in so many ways is like a thank you letter from the Apostle Paul to uh, the believers there at Philippi. Now, if you've ever read through Philippians or have been a part of a church that's taught through Philippians or have read a book on Philippians or a commentary on Philippians, you probably know then that Philippians is often considered the epistle of joy or the, the letter of joy. And the reason it's referred to as the letter of joy is because in four short chapters, the Apostle Paul uses the word joy and rejoicing some 19 times. And if we didn't know any better, we would think, well, man, I'm reading this book and Paul's like rejoicing in this and joy about that. And, 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 and I'm reading and I'm thinking to myself, man, Paul must be living large. This may be a, a good season in Paul's life. He may have got that house on the hill. He may be driving a convertible. Paul has arrived. I don't know if he won the lottery or he got that promotion or finally entered into that kind of career position he had always wanted, but dang, man, this guy's happy. And when you read a letter of joy, you, you perhaps think that, and you think that because for you and I, oftentimes our joy is so often associated with our circumstance. I'm happy because this is a good season of life. I'm, I'm happy, I'm full of joy because because I got that new puppy, or I got that new job, or I got that wife, or husband, or... And it's not that there's not happiness and joy in those things, but we far too often associate biblical joy with our circumstance. And there's problems with that, because you see, Paul is writing this letter of joy from prison. He hadn't arrived. He was in prison. This wasn't a fun time in the Apostle Paul's life, yet he was so full of joy. Why? Because his joy was not bound up in his circumstances. Where is your joy this morning? Is it in Jesus? Can you honestly say, my joy is found in Jesus? Because the Apostle Paul could. And I pray to God that, that I will be able to say that all the days of my life. And I ask this question, is your, your joy found in Jesus? Because Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, this famous verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, is a verse that, listen, that is all about contentment. That's what the verse is about. It is perhaps the most misquoted verse in all of the verses that we're going to cover in this series. And sometimes when we're reading scripture, it can be challenging, right? Let's just be honest. You're reading, you're like, what does that mean? You know, or you might be reading a, a passage of scripture and you, you don't get it, right? Maybe it went over your head. And sometimes we need to go to Greek lexicons and, and we, we need to go to um, scholars who are uh, were around long before us who have a, a better understanding and idea of, of historical context. And, and sometimes we need to use these aids as we're interpreting Scripture, right? And obviously, we, the Holy Spirit. But the crazy thing is, is though this verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, is perhaps the most misquoted verse in all the Bible, um, its context is not challenging to understand. If you just don't take that verse out of Philippians and put it on a bumper sticker, and you just actually read it in context, it's not hard to understand. It is not hard uh, to understand. It, it's, it's actually rather uh, simple. But it's one of those most commonly misused 
verses, and, and you see it all the time, in, not just from pulpits, but you, you see it in, in popular culture, even among like brothers like, like Tim Tebow. I love Tim Tebow. He's my brother in Christ. Okay, but, but God, when Philippians 4.13, on your eye things for the national championship, don't think he cared that much, right? <laughs> for sure, didn't have that in mind. Okay, love you, brother. I'll see you in heaven. We're going to rejoice in Jesus together. This doesn't mean he's a heretic. It doesn't mean he's not saved. He is. He loves Jesus. And you've got guys like, <laughs> years later, John Jones comes on the scene, the, 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 the youngest UFC champion in history, and he's as a cage fighter who gets Philippians 4.13 as he becomes champion on his... That's just for sure not the context of the verse. Like 100%. Like it's not even debatable. That's just not the context uh, of the verse. And so the, the passage is not blackboard material to fire up the troops, to climb that mountain and to conquer this, that, and the rest. You see, because life isn't made on a metal stand. It's, it's, it's forged in the trenches. And the funny thing about Philippians 4.13 is, it, is it's, it's, again, it's not hard to see the context. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dive right into the text now. Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 10. The Apostle Paul writes this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So, so Paul, right out the gates, is like, look, church, I, I know. I want you to know that I know you would give me the shirt off your back. I know that there aren't a lot of you, but I know that you are a generous people who recognize you serve a generous God who bankrupted heaven and gave us Jesus. And because of that, though you have little, you give much. I get that. I saw the multiple offerings you sent to the Thessalonian church. I saw the offerings you sent to Rome. I, I see it. I understand these things, verse 11, not, not that I am speaking of, of being in need. In other words, I recognize, man, you guys are a generous people, but not that I'm speaking as of being in need, for I've learned that whatever situation I am in, to be what? Content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now as you, you read it in its context, you begin to realize, oh snap. Like Paul's talking about like, wh whether I have a lot of stuff or nothing at all. Whether I'm living large or not at all. Whether you give to me or you don't give to me, I will be content because my contentment is not found in what I have, but who I am in Christ. Whenever I fly, I just gotta, this is like a real random fun fact. Whenever I fly, I don't know about you, but I, I used to fly a lot more, right? When I lived in Mallorca, Spain, <laughs> I'd take trips a couple times a year to visit family members. And you know, those, those long flights, they got, they try their best to give you every little thing to keep you occupied while you're in, because it's a long flight. Right? And so, uh, I don't know about you, but before we even take off, I've, I've read everything in the little the seat back in front of you. I try to like pace myself, but I'm done. By the time the thing, I'm like, oh my God, what is this, a delay? What's going on here? But I don't know about you, but every time I read those little magazines, there is one magazine that's in there. That for, first of all, it has like every little gadget you, you've always wanted. Every gadget that's ever existed that you didn't even know existed, like weird stuff. Like, look at this fountain that hides your key in the center of it. You push a button down here. I'm like, what? Who invented this stuff? Why do we need this? But I want one. You know? I don't even have a house. I don't have a key. You know, I'm just, but, but, but it's crazy. And you read through this thing and, and, and you're just like, wow, I'd like that. I'd like, let me, why don't I just take my pen out and start circling all the things I want in some magazine I'm not keeping? You know, and it's just kind of like Christmas as a kid. And I'm circling a bunch of stuff I'm, I'm never going to get. But by the end of that flight, I'm thinking, man, I wish I had all that stuff. And then I go home thinking, why can't I have all that stuff? What was the name of that magazine? I'll go up to see if they have a website. Um, and there was another magazine in there that had all these beautiful homes. And it was just so purposeful, right? You, I'm flying into Mallorca, beautiful island off the coast of Spain. And all, this magazine, I'm telling you, had all of these massive mansion-like homes on the cliffs of Mallorca. You watch the sunset every night in your infinity pool. I'm just like, 
I want one of those houses, Lord. I'm giving up everything for you. Here I am living with six dudes in bunk beds. Okay? I'm, I'm like, I'm pushing 30. I need, I, need, I need a house like that. Come on, Lord. Come through. Why can't I have a... And all of a sudden, I'm so... <laughs> from looking at two stupid magazines in a plane, I'm discontent. And I'm walking off the plane thinking about everything I don't have. And, well, and if I only had this, and if I only, if I only had that, and, and, and there's this... God, I thought about this because listen, yesterday we had a men's breakfast at, at, at my place and, and I'm just thinking, dude, it's so hot in here. Because here's what was happening. As I was studying, as, as I was studying, I, I'm, I'm thinking about all these things and on the TV, have you guys ever watched those shows where you, they're like house hunters and like far and away, like am I going to stay or am I going to go? And, and they're just like, and these houses are like, wow. There's those ones with the real estate agents, like, like high level real estate guys in Manhattan. Okay, and, you, and you, you follow these guys in Manhattan, you're seeing some of these condos and these penthouses, and I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, that like hot, muggy men's breakfast we just had? I'm thinking, that place has got central air, Lord. I could serve you better. <laughs> just come through, God. Open a door or two or three, you know? There's lots of millionaires and billionaires in New York City. Let them just give me one. I want one of those. Um, but, but the reality is, is, there is a discontentment that can well up within all of us. If we're honest from time to time. You know, if, we've, if we only had a different job or if I only lived in a different location or if, and advertisers capitalize on this stuff, right? With billboards and now it's like your whole feed. Like I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm looking, we're praying about possibly getting a, a used car, right? And so I'm, I'm kind of scrolling through the thing and, and every three pictures on Instagram is a different car dealership. I'm like, how do they even know I'm looking? <laughs> they know. Commercials everywhere you look. And, and the Apostle Paul gives us this a great advice in Scripture to deal with, to combat this discontentment. Um, he says, whatever state you are in, be content. Contentment is, is learned. We must, as Christians, learn to be content. We have to learn it, right? Because if we do not learn to be content, what will happen inevitably is we will be um, devoured by the dogs of discontentment. Just like Ahab and Jezebel. Now listen, I know everybody's heard of Jezebel, even if you've never read 1 Kings chapter 21. You're like, oh, Jezebel? Yeah, I know that. We call women that that are kind of like this. You know, and some people never even read the passage, but they, you know, oh, she's a Jezebel. Yeah, okay, you know where Jezebel came from? That girl you're calling that probably doesn't deserve that, okay? Uh, Jezebel in, in, in 1 Kings chapter 21 was married to a pansy named Ahab, right? This, this is a real story. You, want, you don't believe me? Read it. I'm not reading into the text. He was. Let's read it. Um, so 1 Kings 21, you got this guy named Ahab. Ahab lives where? In a, a palace, okay? A king, right? He's living in a palace. And he's got a next door neighbor named Naboth. And Naboth has a vineyard right next to, to him, and, and he's kind of like, he's overlooking, he's seeing this kind of vineyard, and he's like, man, I want that vineyard. Isn't that what happens? Looking in the catalogs, and he's like, oh, oh, I want that. And so he sees the vineyard, he's like, I want that, I want that. I'm gonna go, go offer Naboth some money or something like that, I got that in abundance, and so he approaches Naboth and says, like, hey, look, I want, your, I want your vineyard, will you give it to me? And Naboth's like, uh, no, okay? So, hey, well, can I buy it from you? No, you can't. Um, and, and Naboth sings like this, like, if I wanted to give it to you, I couldn't. If you offered me a deal that I couldn't refuse, I still couldn't. Why? Because this vineyard is inherited property. And in those days, if you had inherited property, you couldn't sell it, you couldn't give it away, you had to keep it. And so Ahab throws a fit like a, like a little, like my daughter, like a four-year-old little schoolgirl. He just kind of, he just, he just gets upset. This guy's not going to give me this, and this is ridiculous, and I really want his vineyard, and he's not going to give me his vineyard. And he, and he just complains all the way home. Read it. It's in the text. And he gets home, and he won't eat. He refuses to eat. Not only does he refuse to eat, then he sleeps with his face against the wall. He's that drama, okay? With a capital Q queen. Th that's that guy, right? Just... Just, he's just acting like it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> this is hilarious. All of a sudden, uh, his, his wife enters, Jezebel. And in verse 5 of 1 
Kings chapter 21. She's like, I'm going to read the text. What's the matter? His wife Jezebel asks him. What's made you so upset that you're not eating? Well, I, I asked Naboth to sell me his vineyard or trade it, but he refused, Ahab told her. Notice he like conveniently leaves out the part about it being an inheritance. Okay? Jerk. Verse 7, it says, oh, are you the king of Israel or not? She says. She says she's trying to pump him up right now. She's like, what? Flex on this guy. Jezebel demanded, get up and eat something. Don't worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. She, she's going to get super manipulative. Um, and so she writes letters in Ahab's name, falsifying documents. Unbelievable. And she sealed them with his seal and she sent them to the elders and other leaders of the town where Naboth lived. And in the letter, she commanded this, call the citizens together for a time of fasting and give Naboth the place of honor. She's not a good person. And so Jezebel calls this big old meeting to make sure that, that Naboth is present at this meeting. And then um, she, she seats. It says there in verse 10, then, then she puts two scoundrels. I love that word. Um, I haven't used it in like, I've never used it. Uh, across, she puts these people across from him. It says, who will accuse him of cursing God and the king. And then take him out and stone him to death. And so she t hires these two goons to lie on him and then to, to kill him. And then the two scoundrels came and sat down across from him and they accused Naboth before all the people saying he cursed God and the king. And so he was dragged outside of the town and he was stoned to death. He was uh, done dirty. And verse 14, it says, Now the town leaders then sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. And when Jezebel heard the news, she said to Ahab, Hey, you know that vineyard Naboth wouldn't sell to you? Well, you can have it now because he's dead. Um, and so he was... Uh, so uh, Ahab immediately, it says, went down to the vineyard of Naboth and, and he went down there to claim it. Um... Bad news for Ahab. The plot begins to thicken because God had a prophet in the room when Naboth was lied on. And so check this out. This is great. But the Lord said to Elijah, go down and meet King Ahab in Israel who rules in Samaria. And he will be at Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel claiming it for himself. And God says, right? God says, give him this message. This is what the Lord says. Wasn't it enough that you killed Naboth, but you must rob him too? <laughs> See, though, though Ahab uh, didn't know about Jezebel's plot. Remember, she did that on the sly. He, he didn't know about that plot. Um, he's getting stuck with the blame uh, because his discontentment and complaining led to it. So he is now going to be responsible for it because he didn't know how to just enjoy his palace. His palace. Build your own vineyard. End of verse 19 it says, because, because you've done this, this is God still writing, because you've done this, dogs will lick your blood in the very place where they lick the blood of Naboth. So uh, Ahab's going down, right? Uh, but it didn't stop there. And regarding Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs will eat her body at the plot of land in Jezreel. We've got bagels after service right through here. Just want to let you know that. Cream cheese, the whole nine. Just wanted to throw that in there. I'm sure that sounds appetizing right about now. But um, so, so what we have now is we have uh, Ahab's getting uh, licked up and Jezebel's getting eaten up. And chapter 22, uh, what ends up happening is, is Ahab leads the armies into battle. He is killed in battle. Uh, after being killed in battle, his uh, team kind of pulls him away and his, his blood has just filled his chariot and... No doubt the last image he saw here on earth were dogs slurping up his blood in a chariot. And Jezebel got hers too as she dressed up in fine linen. She was tossed off a balcony and dogs ate her body there. 
The crazy thing is, is it, it, it didn't have to be. And it just goes to show that just because you have little doesn't mean you're the only one who struggles with discontentment. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are in life, you'll always be discontent if you're discontent right now. Because you may have little, but even if you had a lot, here's a man with a palace. They asked Rockefeller, how much is enough, bro? And Rockefeller's response as the richest man alive at the time was just a little bit more. Always just a little bit more. The richest person on earth at the time said just a little bit more. It's never enough. So will you allow the dogs of discontentment to eat your contentment in Jesus? When a man or woman doesn't find themselves learning contentment, they will ultimately be devoured by those very dogs. And so the question then that is, <coughs> I would pose to us this morning is, well, how do I uh, find contentment? How do I avoid a discontentment? And, and I would say is, is I'm running the risk of, of sounding crazy simplistic, um, but, but sometimes the truth is just the truth and the answer is just the answer. Um, keep your eyes on Jesus and stop taking them off Jesus. Every time you feel discontent in your life, recognize right there, very practically, I am discontent in who I am in Jesus and who He's called me to be. Recognize that the Lord loves you with an everlasting love. Like a love that we just can't even fathom. A love that, that doesn't waver. He loves you the same on your worst day as He does on your best. Because sometimes we're like, well, I received Jesus and now I just feel like, man, I'm so loved. And then we make some mistakes and we mess up and we sin and we fall. And all of a sudden we begin to, to buy into the lie that, oh, God doesn't love me as much today, but I'm going to do really good stuff tomorrow. And I'm going to go to community group this week. And I've even circled that outreach he mentioned on my calendar. I'm, I'm making all these good plans. And so now, now God surely is going to love me a little bit more and he'll, he'll look at me in a, a little bit better light. And, I'm, and surely I'll get more favor from God if I, no. That is anti-Bible and anti-Gospel. Jesus loves you the same when you are falling into, stumbling in sin as He does when you are raised hands worshiping Him in a sanctuary. His love is not fickle like our love. His love does not change. It does not waver. It is steadfast. Fix your eyes on Jesus and go to war in the spiritual knowing that the enemy would love for you to wallow in all of the things that you don't have and all of the things that you want but don't have. And so keep your eyes on Him knowing that He, that he has a purpose in, in everything that you're going through. Because listen, the, the truth of the matter is, is we go through hard stuff sometimes. Let's be honest, man. We struggle. Sometimes, we, sometimes life is really, really hard. But if, if we could learn the art of preaching to ourselves taking the, the holy truth of God's Word and preaching it to ourselves, when I'm going through it, when I feel like I'm done, I can recognize that the Bible teaches that, that God's not done with me. Um, that, that God is, is allowing me to go through certain things in my life now because He's got stuff for me ahead. Right? He's, he's, he's building it. Another verse. Maybe we'll even do it in this series. Uh, uh, I, uh, what's uh, Romans 8... Um, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purposes. Yeah, but what we don't understand is, is all things working together for good is the intrinsic good. It doesn't mean you're getting a private jet or a house on a hill. It's the intrinsic good. In other words, no matter what is going on around us, God will work even the terrible things out for our good in the end as we love Him and as we keep our eyes on Jesus, He's doing a, a good work in you that may not feel good right now. Let's be honest. It may not feel good right now. But if you understood the outcome, if you could see it from God's perspective, you'd have a little bit more patience, right? If I said, 
you know, Chandler, come up on stage afterwards and I'm gonna punch you in the face as hard as I can. Um, you would be like, no, don't sign me up. If I said, yeah, but after I punch you in the face, $10 million is gonna get don't, just, just auto-drafted into your account, you'd be like, sign me up. Why wait till after service, right? Because you know what's coming. You know what's coming. But oftentimes we just can't get past what we are going through to realize that God is working in us. <coughs> In life, there are going to be hurts and there are going to be disappointments and there are things that are not always going to go our way. But God is preparing us for what is to come. So it would do us well to not complain, to not murmur, and to find our contentment in, in who Jesus is. And sometimes it's hard. When, when God called me to the mission fields in, in Spain, um, I had a two-bedroom condo like on the beach in the OC, Orange County, right? I had a brand new car. I had a job that I was skyrocketing up the, the, the ranks. Incredible. I mean, God, it was, God was doing some, some great stuff in that season. But what happens when God says, eh, season over, I want you over there to live with six guys in some bunk beds. But I got a two-bedroom condo on the beach and I like to jog along the beach. Oh, that's okay. There's beaches in Mallorca. Oh, okay. Uh, so, like, look, could have been sent to a worse place, right? But, um, but God said go, and I had a choice to make. I had a decision. Am I going to be obedient to the God who's provided for me all of these things? Is he worth more than a condo by the beach? Is he worth more than a brand new car? Is he worth more than a thriving <laughs> career? And the answer is yes. Every single moment of every day, yes, he is. But it was challenging. It wasn't without challenges when you're living with five, six other dudes who, I have pet peeves. Okay, I got pet peeves. I've told you some of mine. Number one pet peeve is when you take a shower, dry off in the shower, okay? Drives me nuts. It's like we shower in a kind of like, it's not like waterproof, but seriously, like all the water goes down the drain. So just grab your towel and dry off and then, then get out. But no, we got to take a shower, be soaking wet, get out of the shower, soak the whole bathroom for the next person who's got to go to the bathroom right after you, who's only wearing socks and not shoes, and they're going to walk in. And it's just like, why? Just dry off in there. Problem solved. There's just a lot of things you got to deal with when you're living with a bunch of people that you didn't have to live with when you're in the two-bedroom condo by the beach. But nothing that we sacrifice. This is just like, what is that? It's pathetic. When he left heaven and died on a cross, for my, took on the sins of the world, like what am I going to complain about? Really? It's, it's absurd. And so I had to learn contentment. I had to preach to myself. That Jesus is better. Jesus is worth it. He's worth every single lowercase s sacrifice that I could ever make. <laughs> we live in a day and age, again, with, with catalogs that breed covetousness. And nowadays, it's even with the physical, isn't it? It's not even just the things that we have. It's like, I've got a wrinkle, I want Botox. I want bigger lips, I'll get Botox. I'm going bald, let me get a wig, a toupee, a surgery, whatever, whatever it takes, you know? And it's not, look, I'm not hating on you. If you have those things, praise God, all right? I'm not talking about that. It's just whatever. But my point is, is this, is that we also live in the day and age of the before and after photo, which is so funny that the old man kind of app was like blowing up because it's like we, we, we want the old man to be like the past and so we can, we can kind of show off our, our present, the, the, the beautifying of myself. And so there's, there's all these kind of wonderful apps to, to do that to yourself. I mean, it was crazy. Like, no, I'm not going to go there. That would be... Um, but, but the problem with it is what happens is, is, is both men and women carry that on into relationships too, don't they? It's like we can, we can struggle so much with, with self-contentment um, that, that we all of a sudden have these kind of like mythical lists that we create of the person that we want to be with or marry. And then you meet that person. They're a great, godly man or woman, but they're just not meeting the standards of Ross Paldark. Or they're not meeting the standards of, in case you've never seen that movie, that's just like... Plug, uh, they're, they're, or, or whatever. What's the guy from Pride and whatever it's called? Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy. Whatever your guy is, Denzel Washington. Um, <laughs> but they're not. They're not meeting that standard. 
It's like, dude, like Vivica A. Fox, that was, when I was younger, she was it. Okay, so, but, but we have these fake, phony lists that it's not real. It's not real. And then we find ourselves so discontent, not just within ourselves, but then we're projecting that onto other people. And so then we live in a world and a society that's just so overwhelmed with discontentment. It's just crazy. Paul had to learn to be content. He had to learn it. He says in verse 12, I know how to be brought low, Philippians chapter 4. I know how to abound in every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I, I've, I've learned these things for the cause of Christ. Paul, could have, Paul was a brilliant man. Paul could have lived a very cushy life, but he chose not to for the cause of Christ. And in his journeys, he had to learn contentment. He, ha he had to say, man, things aren't the way I wish they were. I know, I know I'm out here kind of for the cause of Christ. I'm preaching the gospel and I'm planting churches and I'm raising up leaders and I got no money. So what do I got to do? I got to do that and I got to get a side hustle. And so he's making tents and selling tents. And when does this guy have time to do all the church planning? All I don't know. Right? But by the grace of God, he's working a job and he's ministering the gospel. And it says, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. These were all things that he had to, to, to learn in his life and in his ministry. Give us this day, Jesus said, our daily bread. There's an old proverb that says, um, Lord, don't give me too much that I don't depend on you, but don't give me too little that I steal. Learn contentment because money is a great servant but a cruel master. Just random, I'll just throw this out there. I was Googling on Crossway, had the, the, the top four in 2019, this list of the top four things that cause people to be discontent. Um, the first one was sexual discontentment in, 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 in an age of pornography, in an age of kind of comparison, sexual discontentment. When can I have sex? I want to have sex now. And, and the Bible's like, no, no, no. When you get married in the confines that I've, I've created sex, right? That, I didn't. God, this is God talking, <laughs> right? He's like, I, I created it so I know the confines in which it should be uh, taking place. And so, you, and so you wait. And so you be patient. And so you exercise the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. A second one was body image. Because, again, we're so bombarded with so many things and it causes us to feel so dis content with who we are and so all of a sudden we're like putting things in us to make us look a certain way that the world says we should look. Third thing is identity. We're so confused now about who we are in Christ. And we just don't get it. We're, it's, it's just identity is a massive thing. We'll do a whole series on identity. We'll come back to that. Um, success. Success is another one of those things that causes so much discontentment because it's not enough to get the job. Once we get the job, all we do is complain about the job and complain about my boss and complain about my schedule and complain about, and we complain, but I was praying for a job. God gave it to me. I rejoiced at God's blessing, but I don't like the way this is going and, and how come I didn't get the promotion and, and I want to, and, and all of a sudden there's just, there's just always this discontentment that exists within our own hearts. Paul had learned through life experience to be content. To be content. Whether he was abased or abound, to be content. And when you read the book of Acts and you see the story of Paul, it's, it's insane. Stoned nearly to death. I mean, there was a, a, Acts chapter 16 where Paul's being snuck out of a city, right? Because he had men waiting outside the city to say, once he comes out, we're going to kill him. And so he snuck out of the city in a basket. It's insane. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 comes to mind. Let me just, let me just pull that up. because this is, this is crazy. Th this is Paul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, uh, far more imprisonments than anybody. With countless beatings. Often near death. Five times I received the hands of the Jews. Forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day adrift at sea. On frequent journeys and dangers from rivers and dangers from robbers and dangers from my own people. Dangers from the Gentiles. Dangers in the city. Dangers in the wilderness. Dangers in the sea. Dangers from false brothers. Toil and hardship. Though many, through many sleepless nights. Hunger, thirst, without food, cold, exposure. That's Paul. That's his life. 
A man that went through all of that is able to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whether I'm abounding, whether I'm a base, whether I've got a lot, whether I've got a little, it doesn't matter. I got Jesus, so I've got everything. That's the Apostle Paul. <laughs> the Apostle Paul was an expert in putting things into perspective, wasn't he? Track with me. This is the Word of God, okay? It's way more important than any joke I could tell. 2 Corinthians 4.17, Paul says, For momentary light affliction... Was that momentary light affliction? I don't know. That was momentary light affliction. I, you know, come on. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. And then he would say in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, the suffering of this world is not even worthy to be compared with the weight of glory that's to be revealed. You can't even compare it. Suffering, cold, starving to death, beaten, shipwrecked, whatever, can't even be compared to the glory that will be revealed. Do you believe that? Because perhaps this morning what you need is a, is a greater view of who God is. Perhaps this morning you just need to go and start devouring the scriptures and, and, and getting to know to a greater, deeper level this great God and Savior named Jesus. Because He's worth it. He's worth it. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Or quite literally in the Greek, it says, I can do all things th uh, in Christ who strengthens me. It's funny because the, the Apostle John said, um, apart from Him, you can do nothing. Apart from Him, you can do nothing. But you can do all things in Him. And, and, I, and I say that as we're beginning to kind of wind down here. Um, this is so important, guys. Because there are the sinful doctrines, really, they are sinful. The sinful doctrines of the health, wealth, and prosperity movement that exist. And sometimes we rub shoulders with those very people who, who would make claims or professions that God wants you to be rich and God doesn't want you to suffer and, and oh, you're sick, it's because you don't have enough faith. I can't tell you how many people who, Jesus-loving, faithful people, given their lives to Jesus who have died of different diseases and died of different accidents and died of in, 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 in circumstances. Every single one of the apostles, how about that? Like crucified upside down, impaled, beheaded. What kind of health, wealth, and prosperity was that? <laughs> and these were his disciples that walked closely with him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is speaking about um, being able to abound in the strength that God gives in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, whether Paul had a little or Paul had a lot. And now, now, now back to the beginning, this verse does not mean that I can scale the Empire State Building and jump off it and because, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me or I can attempt to walk through walls Have you ever tried to walk on water? Be honest. This is a random <laughs> thought that just came to me. I've done it. Didn't work. But God could. God could do that, right? He, he could allow us to do that, but that's not what this verse is talking about. I've often wondered on the Sea of Galilee, when you take those boat trips, how many people have... I've always wanted to ask the guy, how many people have just tried to step out? Just be honest with me. You know, because I, I would have laughed, right? But uh, Because God can do those things. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can do anything He wants to do. He can heal. He can deliver. He can make one man rich and another man poor. He can do whatever He wants. Because He's God and we are not. However, that is not what this verse is talking about. This verse in context is speaking about what? Contentment. Contentment. Thank you. Contentment. It's the Spirit of God empowering a Christian that enables us to find contentment. And the way that he wraps it up in verse uh, 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, yet it was, it was kind of you, brothers and sisters, it was kind of you to share in my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. 
Even in Thessalonica, you, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your account. Paul's like, look, I'm just, I'm so grateful. I, like, I, I, I want to I I big up you for being a generous people. Praise God for you. I'm, I'm grateful for that. But it's just this weird like verse, right? Because he's just like, he's like wanting to thank him, but kind of never really thanks them. But he's like, you know, thank you for being so generous and for, for thinking about me. I didn't need it because I got Jesus, but I'm grateful more than any of those things because um, those things will be credited to your account in an eternal kingdom where, where, where moths can't get to it and rust can't get to it. You have rewards that you are um, storing up in heaven. And Paul ends the section by saying, I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus your gifts that you sent, the fragrant offering, the sacrifice that's acceptable and pleasing to God, that sweet smelling aroma. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ. There is a difference between wants and needs, aren't there? My kids get that. Well, actually, kids are probably the only ones that don't get that. There's a difference between, I need it. No, you don't need a Dumbo doll, right? You, 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 it's like, but we have matured in Christ, and we, we begin to understand that there are wants and needs. My, my, my needs are air, okay? Uh, I, need, I, need, I need food. I don't need kind of Chateaubriand at a like, steakhouse in Manhattan. I don't need that, right? But I do need food. I need sustenance. I need, we, need, we need water. We need... Um, perhaps transportation, we've, but we've, we've created something in our day and age called consumer debt because we don't understand the difference between one and need. God would call us to live within our means and, and most of the time people in the church are not generous people is because they've spent so much of what they have and, and, and in an abundance they've spent so much of what they don't have on themselves that they no longer have room to, to give and, and to be a part of blessing the furtherance of God's um, kingdom in, in a community, in their community, in our community. And so that's how I want to close this with circling back to our announcements. We are a... a we are a church that may be uh, small in number. There are, there are mega churches that exist in our city. But I've been part of a lot of churches in a lot of different countries, and I'm, I'm just telling you that, that there are... I don't ever want to be the church that just exists for the Sunday service. It's like... I don't ever want to be the church that just exists for the, the light show and the, and the fanciful worship and the, and the experience without there ever being substance. That's why when we planted this church, before we ever had a service, we said, we want to serve before we ever had a service. We went out into the poorer communities among us and we brought hundreds and hundreds of Christmas presents to kids who didn't have Christmases. We went out and served the community. We did prayer walks. We loved on people in our community before we ever started a Sunday service that we could invite people to. Because what we wanted to do is we wanted to set a culture we wanted to be a, a, a part of our DNA as a church, uh, that we would be a church that are like Christ, not just in word, but in deed. That we would be a people who recognize and see the needs around us and wouldn't try to pass it off on the next politician to fix things that we are called by God to fix. And so seriously, man, cir circle, that, circle that date on your calendar. I've been so... Like sometimes I think through things and then I just blurt them out on a Sunday and they're like, why did I tell that? I wasn't even sure if I wanted to do that. You know, just like when I say stuff and I'm going to do that right now. So we, there's like a lot of ministries that we have at church and I've just been like praying. I know I've talked to a few of you about it, but I've just been praying. I'm like, man, I think what we need to do is we just need to kill a lot of ministries. We just need to like, like hit the delete button on some programs we have. And the reason I say that is not because there's not fruit in it. And it's not, it's not because it's, it's not a good thing or a blessing for the church, but sometimes what happens is you can have so many different programs and so many different options that you're like, hmm, you're looking through the catalog of things you could do today with the church. And you know what, you know what almost, almost always gets left off that decision to do? Is outreach. Is reaching the lost, serving the community, almost always. 
because we'd rather get tea and crumpets. That's how you say it. We, 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 would, we would rather go get a burger with the guys. We, we would rather do those things that are not bad. They're good things. That's community. That's, that's fellowship. Those are good things. But we'd rather do those things than, than that which God commands us in the Great Commission. And so this is not about beating you guys down. This is not about a, this like condemning word. This is about, man, let's stir up among one another. Let's stir one another up to, to good works that we would take what we know and we would apply it to our community so that our community would never be the same. Why? Because we exist here. A remnant, a people of God that are right here in this very community. Father, thank you for...